great. Thank you very much. Um, and, and many of you I know are from Monterey. And, and we know Monterey as being such an incredibly beautiful place to live, a, a shore that is coveted by everyone, a, full of wildlife, full of beauty. Um, it's also home to the Hopkins Marine Station. Uh, we have been here for over 100 years. The very first president of Stanford, David Starr Jordan, was ranked as one of the best fish biologists in the world when he became the president of Stanford. And he wanted Stanford students to be able to learn marine biology. Um, the Hopkins Marine Station was established. We had our first uh, set of students come by in 1892. And we have been in Monterey ever since. And the station, sitting next to a newcomer, you may have heard of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, um, <laughs> has seen a lot of changes in Monterey. Because although it's stunningly beautiful now, this, these are the rocks right outside the Hopkins Marine Station. Uh, it wasn't in the past, 70 or 80 years ago, when the canneries were going strong. Uh, they were processing a million pounds of sardines a day. And 100,000 pounds of fish guts were going into the bay. The air was foul. The water was foul. Uh, and the wildlife was gone. The whales were gone. The seabirds were gone. The abalone were gone. The sardines eventually were gone. Uh, and Carolyn Sotka and I wrote about this in a book that uh, came out about three years ago called The Death and Life of Monterey Bay. Because what you're sitting in the middle of right now is an incredible revival story. Because it's not the story is not that just Monterey got worse. The story is that it got better. And the book talks about that. Along the way, we discovered that there's many characters that really play a role. I want to tell you a little bit about this one. It's cute. Um, the sea otter. Now, the reason why the sea otter plays strongly in the first book is that it has two traits that were incredibly important to its role in the decline in Monterey Bay and then its recovery. The fur is fabulous, 800,000 hairs per square inch, soft, beautiful, and warm. These are small animals. They live in cold water, and that fur keeps them warm. So they were hunted to nearly extinction. 100,000 otters were taken off of this coast in the, in the 1800s uh, for um, the fur industry. But the other feature of otters that makes them really important is they're hungry. They eat a quarter of their body weight a day in fresh seafood. They have an incredible metabolism to keep warm in this cold water. And because of that, they keep the ecosystem in balance. Without them, herbivores ran wild. Sea urchins ran wild along the coast. They ate the kelp. And the kelp forest virtually disappeared by the late 1800s. Now, the kelp forest is back because in April 1963, the otters came back to Monterey Bay. And they came to the Hopkins Marine Station, where uh, a marine protected area had been established by Julia Platt a few decades before. So we saw the reassembly of this ecosystem from Hopkins and that spread around the bay. Now, in, in that book, we focus a lot on the otters. And we discovered this interesting fact that these stories make a big difference. That it's an interesting way to teach people science and also an interesting way to get people engaged in what's happening. So as a consequence, uh, the next book, which is out this month, I've written with my son, Anthony, uh, who is also a graduate of the creative writing program at Stanford 2005. And the idea is to combine the skills of a novelist, that's that's Tony, uh, with a scientist to try to paint the narratives of the stories of these critters as they, as they live their lives. You know, sharks are extreme. But there's a lot more out there in the ocean that's extreme, too. There's the hottest, the coldest, the deepest, the oldest. All of that is in the extreme life of the sea. It took us a long time to find a place where we could do that shot without alarming a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> The book uh, tries to paint the story of the life of the sea. And I want to tell you some of these stories to give you an idea what that's like and the power of the narrative and the science combined. Because I really do think that there's a huge future in that, in telling science and environmental stories. Um, and, and, and the main point is that you really do not care about the plot 
of a story, of um, a movie, and so you care about the characters. And these are the characters. For example, sailfish, some of the fastest fish in the ocean. They can swim at 40 miles an hour, but they also have to eat at 40 miles an hour, like stopping for a cup of coffee without stopping. At 40 miles an hour, the sailfish boom through their baitfish. They're slapping the baitfish with their bill. They have 1 50th of a second between smacking a fish with the bill, turning and eating it. And in that 1 50th of a second, they have a problem because their eyes don't work very well and their brains don't work very well at cold seawater temperatures. So Barbara Block at the Hopkins Marine Station has discovered that sailfish have heaters behind their eyeballs to keep their retinas warm. And they have heaters on their optic lobes to keep their brains warm in order to be able to see fast enough to eat at the speeds that they have. You can also take people to places in a book that are really difficult to get to. This is the bottom of the Antarctic Sea. It looks clear, but the water is very, just because the water is very clear. Uh, the top there is not clouds, it's ice. And this water is minus two degrees centigrade, colder than water usually freezes, but it's salt water. Ice still forms every once in a while, though. And what you see here are ice crystals that are forming on the bottom of the ocean and then growing up almost as living things. But they're ice crystals. They're ice fans. And sometimes they actually entomb the animals on the bottom like these starfish. But it's worse if you're a regular fish because your blood is less salty than seawater. And it's going to freeze before anything else. So ice fish ones that live in the Antarctic, have evolved a protein called ice protein, floats around in their blood, and it attacks small ice crystals if they should ever form in the bloodstream. And those proteins coat the ice crystals, and they keep them from growing, and they keep them from killing the fish. Now, that's very useful to the fish, but it's also incredibly useful to us for a really important, incredibly society-driven problem that we all face almost every day, and that's our ice cream. Because our ice cream is going to get big ice crystals in it, especially if it's low-fat ice cream. And so enterprising marine biologists and chemists have devised a way to take the genes of the, uh, in this case, the Atlantic eel pout, make the ice protein from those genes in yeast, put a tiny little bit in the ice cream, and it keeps the ice crystals from forming. And that's why it can still be slow-churned, low-fat, and not have big ice crystals in it. Uh, you'll get used to that in a little while. It took me, <laughs> took me about six months to go back and eat that again. <laughs> Other places in the ocean are incredibly different. The deep sea is dark. It's very, very uh, empty of food generally. And the fish that we see there are incredible machines for eating. This is the stop light loose jaw. It can eat a fish bigger than itself, but it also has two other adaptations that are really rare. Most of the light in the deep sea is, is bioluminescence. It's blue and green. These sneak. They have red searchlights that beam out of their cheekbones. You can see them there. This is an artistic rendering, but you can see them there. They also have retinas and eyes that have mutations in the rhodopsins that let them see red. So they're the only fish with red light. They're the only fish that can see red light. And that's how they move around the bottom of the ocean feeding. All these stories combine some drama, often, uh, and a lot of science. And the purpose of that was to combine those together in a narrative that lets us not just explain things to people, but entertain people with the science that's there. Hopkins has been operating for over 100 years. Uh, we have a group of undergraduates. We have a group of graduate students. We have a group of faculty that's some of the best people in marine science in the entire world. This is some of them uh, basically in the laboratory at Hopkins because we can get them out into the field to see what's there. Uh, the opportunity to do that is an opportunity to, to understand the ocean world, to do research in it. And what we're hoping to do with this project of combining novelists and scientists is also to teach students and to let students communicate what they know out into the rest of the world. Thank you.